we're all ready. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements based on questions I received over the weekend and uh, something I would like you to check as well. So I'm going to go ahead and address that right now. First off, I got the purchasing of SimNet question multiple times over the weekend. So I need you to check, I need you to go into SimNet I need you to click on your name in gold in the upper right corner, and I need to see if this option shows up for you. You probably have to go under pro, I think it's under products. Is it under products? Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat. Pay for access, buy online. Okay, there it is. So if you click buy online, okay, what options do we have? Ah, okay, office intro. It says Excel complete, CE 23. Yeah, you have that option. It's the $108 option. You've got it in there. Okay, so I hope that answers the question because you gotta click buy online to see the options. Oh, yeah, you just got to click on your name and then buy online. It's the $108 option. Yeah, so after you click your name, you just got to go to buy online, and that's where you're going to go to purchase it when it's time to purchase it. Yeah, I can't see it on my end, so that's the one. If you're all wondering what that is, which one to pick, it's the $108 option when you are ready. I know you still have another week. So people online, hopefully you heard me say that. It's the $108 option, not the other options. Because you notice that the words match the one I have up here on the screen. They're like, well, you can add it. I'm like, it's already been added. I just wanted to know which one it is. <laughs> so it's this one. If you need to refer back to this, you can refer back to the video. Or you can ask me and I'll tell you it's this one. Okay, the other question I got over the weekend is, what are we supposed to be doing? So I'm going to reiterate this one more time. And that is in the classroom, we do the Computing Essentials 2023 chapter content on Tuesdays, and we do the SimNet projects on Thursdays. Outside the classroom, you are responsible for the exams from Computing Essentials, the individual research project, which won't happen for several weeks, and the SimNet Sim books and lessons. Those are the tutorials. So each sim book should be completed, should be, it's not a requirement, should be completed before we work on a project in the class. How'd you get to that screen? Uh, it's because I'm a player right now, but it's not accepting my password that I'm using. No. Oh. Really? It's not requesting your pass. It's not accepting your password. Yeah. That's so weird. Okay. Well, there is a forgot your password link, but I don't know. If, I don't. I don't know if that's safe or not. This is the first. This is the first semester we've done this um, using the business department's server and not our own server, which we've been on for a long time. So anyhow, yes, at, at your leisure, if somebody wants to tell me, um, you want to tell me how what happens when you go and do that stuff. Please, yes, please let me know, because I can't see that on the student side. I can only see it on the instructor's side. All right, but anyway, this is just a friendly reminder of what you're responsible for each week. Um, I will probably remind you in a few weeks again if I continue to get the questions, but I'm just wanting to address this because I got it from multiple students. All right, so today we're going to go over chapter two covering the internet, the web, and electronic commerce. Now, nobody, I don't, I don't think there might not be anybody in here that remembers this, but you know, there was actually a time where <laughs> we didn't have access to the internet. And we actually had to socialize with people. And we actually had to, yes, travel to go purchase things. Like clothing, for example. We always had to either go to the mall, we had to go to a store, or we had to go somewhere to get physical items. We can't just like order it on our phones now. I love using phones now. I love not having to go to stores for anything now. I love not having to go to a bank. I love not having to do a lot of things now that I have technology. Now that we have technology, we shouldn't be doing a lot of those things. So we don't really get out as much 
as we used to. However, this is accurate. This is extremely accurate. Time was boring, especially when you had to wait in lines to do things. And you're just sitting there waiting for hours and hours and hours. And it was awful. It was awful. But we were bored. We were, for the most part, we were bored. A lot of stuff was done manually. It was not done through a computer. I'll never forget those days where I'm sitting there handwriting stuff going, why can't I just put this into a computer? Well, sorry, Nick, we don't have laptops. You have to handwrite everything when we're out in the field. And I'm like, really? So, yes, there was plenty of times where we didn't have technology, but now we do. So, in the first lecture that I gave you a week ago, I actually asked you to think about the internet itself as the physical infrastructure. That is, the servers, the cables, the wires, the satellites, all the physical material that makes up the massive network of networks. Now, of course, we're going more wireless now than ever. However, I would like you to think about the internet itself as the physical infrastructure. I want you to think about the web as what you see in a web browser. It's the stuff that's stored on those servers that you see in front of your faces right now. You all see it in front of your faces right now. That's the web. So they are not the same thing. Now, the internet, as I said before, it's the network of networks. It's the large, largest network in the world. It spans all over the globe. But in 1969, which was now over 50 years ago, ARPANET was created, the Advanced Research Project Agency Network, and it consisted of four different sites, as you see on the slide here. It consisted of University of Utah, Stanford, University of California, Los Angeles, and University of California, Santa Barbara. Those were the four sites. And back then, they weren't connected wirelessly. <laughs> back then, they actually had to run miles and miles and miles of cable. Think about this. This was 50-something years ago. We didn't have wireless technology back then. So, of course, over time, technology got better and better and better. And now we've got networks everywhere. We have wireless networks. We have wired networks. We have all kinds of networks. But now they're all over the globe. Now, there's a pretty big gap here, as you can see. So between 1969 and 1991, so Sir Tim Berners-Lee, that's the person in the bottom right corner of this slide, developed a web browser called World Wide Web, all one word, and that's what he's sitting there with in the picture. He developed this in 1991 at the Center for European Nuclear Research. So this gave people a way to visually see what is stored on the internet. And of course, we've had web browsers ever since. Now, are there text-based browsers that are out there that have no images? Yes, and I've used those as well over the course of my career. And I'm going to tell you, seeing the word image instead of the actual image drove me insane. I'm like, where are they going to put pictures? I'm like, it's a computer. Shouldn't it be showing me pictures? And then finally, we had the, those browsers, and I was like, thank you. Of course, my dad thought I was nuts. I can talk about my dad, and I can trash talk my dad now because he's deceased, so I get to do that now this semester for the first time. So he always said, you're crazy. These you're not going to do anything with these computers. Why, why are you staring? This was all like cutting edge stuff at the time in the 90s, so I'm like, I'm like, I have the only computer out of all my friends. I have the only computer. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm like, I'm on, like, I'm on the cutting edge of this stuff. My dad's like, it's never going to take off. None of, it, none of it's ever going to happen. Well, he was certainly wrong, especially when he started ordering food for himself on his phone. <laughs> See? Yeah, we, we had some good laughs about that one, too. <laughs> what? Oh, is it doing tax and stuff? I'm guessing. Okay. It's still cheaper than the bookstore. Still cheaper than the bookstore. Thank you for letting me know. So yes, if you're buying the books online, everybody, they're going to do a tax, I guess tax and service fee, whatever the service fee is for that, but still cheaper than the bookstore bundle. Right, thank you very much for, for verifying that. And I hope it gives you all the content. If it does not, you will let me know. Okay, <laughs> we will get you all the content. All right, so there have been three generations of the web over the years. So when we were first using the web, I say we, I don't know how many of you are included in that, but me, when I was first using the web, 
I really only used it for one purpose. That was to search for things. That was to search for information. That's all I was doing. That's all I was doing. So in the early days of the web, the focus was on linking information like one page to another, to another, to another, to an all. Oh, I'll talk about the extra credit. Don't worry, folks. You don't have to do the extra credit today while you're while you're doing this. I'll explain it after the. I'll explain it after um, I'm done. However, search programs were used in this first generation of the web, which gave us the ability to search for information. Are we still using search programs today? The answer is yes. Except for now, we can speak it. We can talk it. Oh, I don't want to freak you all out, but your phones actually are listening to you all the time. So if you like say a sentence, and then you want to go search for it, if you type one letter, it types the whole sentence for you. I'm like, they're listening. <laughs> so I try not to speak or say any of the magic words that kick off your phones. I'm not going to do that during this semester either. We're not going to say any of those words in this, in this class, because then, yeah, stuff will start happening. So we're not going to do that. Anyway, moving on. I'm rambling again. Told you, told you to do something when I'm doing all right. The second generation, social media starts coming out. And so the second generation, or Web 2.0, focuses now on social interaction. So Facebook, any type of social media site that came out, I want to say MySpace, right? I still have an account, by the way, just to let you know. So yes, MySpace was out at that time, too. But that was the second generation of the web. So that allowed us for more social interaction. Now, the lady that ultimately became my wife chatted with me a lot <laughs> during that time uh, before we actually got together and got married and all the other stuff and the rest is history because <laughs> she's still with me. So Web 2.0 played a pretty big role in, at least with communication. But now everything is AI. Everything is artificial intelligence. Everything is computer generated. It's crazy. Like we don't even have to think stuff anymore. We just have to say it and our phone hears it and we go to search for it. Boom, it comes up. It's weird. Like whenever I'm talking with my wife about a recipe, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this. I push the first letter of what I just said, and it comes up, and I'm like, and then I just go make it. And then she's like, so it's just like that. And I'm like, that's how it's supposed to work. I say it, I push the letter, it gives me the recipe and the directions, and I follow it. It's not hard. <laughs> that is if you have all the ingredients, right? you got to have all the stuff, right? That does help. Otherwise, I got to run to the store. And she's like, where are you going? I'm going to the store. But anyway, it's all Web 3.0 now focused on personalized content. So especially when you're like searching for things, especially my Amazon people in here. So you're going to buy one product, then it's going to suggest another one, suggest another one, suggest another one. You're just going to keep putting stuff in your cart. No, you don't do that. OK, I do that. Like, hey, I need some socks. Hey, I need a pair of pants. Hey, I need this. And all of a sudden, $80 later, you're like, did I really need all that? Remove, 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 remove. Okay, no? You don't do that? All right, anyway. So this hasn't been updated yet, but I love to show this graphic with each iteration of this graphic in this class. This is not in your book. So you notice that Google and YouTube are pretty much the most popular websites worldwide. You'll notice a lot of other ones on here, Facebook, what is now X, they did not change Twitter there, but it's there, Instagram, <clears throat> you notice a lot of those, Wikipedia is really, really big. Yes, we'll get into Wikipedia at least one point in this class, we'll talk about that. But you'll see all the other sites up here too, you'll notice Amazon's up here. But I actually like to have people think about this though, so before the pandemic, before the pandemic, all of our all the meeting software was not really pop was not really popular meeting software like zoom meeting software like skype those were not popular those were not popular programs until the pandemic hit then those started taking off like really taking off as far as popularity is concerned so when i looked at this graphic like 6 years ago back in 27 6 7 years ago back in 2017 it was a lot different than it is now. Well, Google and YouTube still dominated as the top two, but the rest of this looked a lot different. There were a lot of little tiny bubbles. Your book talks about online entertainment. There's literally limitless entertainment out there now. I don't think we could spend, I mean, we only have 24 hours in a day, I think. They have not run the new 2024 numbers yet because we are not done with 2024. So just to let you know, 
And we still use internet service providers to access the internet, whether it's through your phone companies, whether it's through your cable companies, whether it's through any type of telecommunications company, they are still an internet service provider even to this day. And there are many of them that are out there. Yes, we will talk about, especially in chapter eight, I'm gonna talk about telephone lines, cable, wireless connections. We're gonna go over all that fiber optics. We'll talk about that in chapter eight, but we will get there in about six weeks. But anyhow, we need those internet service providers. Web browsers. Here are the six most popular browsers that are still out there. Yes, I'm gonna show you the numbers and I'm gonna show you the metrics here that are current in just a moment because you know that slide's coming. But these are the top six browsers that are out there. And browsers, again, allow you to access what is on the internet visually. So I want you to think about the web as visual, the internet is the physical infrastructure. Okay, that's just, that's how I want you to differentiate the two. All right, so we do need to put in addresses still. We don't have to put in the HTTP part anymore. We can just put in Amazon.com, Apple.com, any site that we're going to. We can just type it in now. We don't have to do that first part, which is the protocol, which I will talk about that in just a moment as well. But these are the top six. So what's the one in the upper left corner? Safari. That's Safari. Very good. What's the one in the upper right? Mozilla. Firefox. Yes, you're both correct. Mozilla and Firefox. That is correct. It's a fox that's on fire. I would hope you would know that. I hope you know the one in the middle. <coughs> it's still the most popular browser out there. Chrome. Chrome, right. That's the one in the dead center. What's the O? What's the red O? Outlook. No. This is a hard one. Especially if you never, especially if you weren't around in the 90s or early 2000s, it's still one of the top six browsers. I can start singing. What do you do? Opera. Opera! Okay, somebody got it. Thank you. Okay, Opera it is. Yes, that is correct. They used to have like Opera Mini for flip phones. That drove me crazy too. Uh, what's the one next to Opera? It's no longer called Internet Explorer. It's now called Microsoft Edge. Edge, correct. Very good. Microsoft Edge, that's the E. Now what's the bottom one? Ooh, I'm gonna throw you for a loop here. It looks like it's a mobile app. Yeah, <laughs> What was that? It's on Samsung, I'm pretty sure. Samsung, yes, you are correct. Samsung Internet is what they call that one. Very good. That was a good guess. So here are your current metrics as of August 2024. Yes, I update this every, every class that I teach. So you'll notice that Chrome still in the lead of 65.18. Safari, a little bit far behind. Edge is way far behind. Then you have Firefox, Samsung Internet, and Opera. All right, I'm going over to this side today. Sorry. Actually, I'll, I'll be over on the right side of your or the, the right side of your screen in a moment. But I'm going to start on the left side over here since I can since I can do that, right? All right. So I purposely ran this from 2009 to now because if you run it 2020 to now, they're all straight lines that go across, and the data isn't fun to look at. So I decided to go back to 2009. Now this blue line up here is not Edge. This was Internet Explorer back into 15 years ago. So almost every computer had Internet Explorer. When I first taught this class, which was five years before the start of this data, it was on literally 95%, 96% of all computers at that point in time. So the market share started to decline. Now there was a program, another web browser called Netscape Navigator, which became Firefox. So, you'll notice that Firefox, that's this line, that's this line here at the 28% mark, actually did pretty well for a while. And then, of course, you notice, just like Internet Explorer, it goes down into the abyss. Chrome. So Chrome, now I'm going to come back over here. So Chrome, in the early days, there were a lot of articles, and you can go look this stuff up. A lot, the, the experts didn't think it was going to pass 20% market share, ever, ever. Google Chrome's never going to pass 20. Look at what it's done. So it quickly started going up and up and up and up, and you know where it's at now. But Internet Explorer went down and down and down and down and down. Now, as an early adopter of Chrome myself, that thing was in beta forever, by the way. 
Just letting you know, that thing was in beta, I think, for at least one or two years before they finally took the beta off and everybody started using it. But in the early days, Chrome was definitely a better browser, like, like for games and stuff, like way better than Internet Explorer. So I got rid of Internet Explorer. I was like, forget that. I'm not using the Microsoft product. And Firefox, I used Firefox a lot back then too. But you will notice that the market shares of pretty much every browser on this list has gone down into the abyss except for Google and Safari. Safari has been steadily going up over time. However, I need to ask you, how many manufacturers make Apple devices? This many. Apple only makes Apple devices. How many manufacturers make Android devices? Because it's open source. So that's why you still see this, and that's why you see Safari down here. But Safari has been steadily going up. That means more Apple devices are getting out there and more people are using it. That's why you see it going up. Edge is a really fascinating uh, story. Edge never really took off. Like it never, like Internet Explorer was dead and Edge was there and it looks like a nice browser. I've been using Chrome for all these years and I don't want to go back. Or if you're a Safari user, you don't want to go back either. So you're going to see all the memes out there. Yes, you heard me say memes in this class about we only use Edge to install a Chrome. That's what I did on this computer. This computer didn't have Chrome and I'm like, I'm going to do it. And I installed it. That's the only reason we use Edge, is to install Chrome, no? But anyway, there's your last 15 years of history on browsers. Oh, really quick. This isn't on a test or anything. I'm just giving you this information. None of this is on a test, by the way. I'm just showing you this. You're going to notice the yellow line that just comes from out of nowhere in like 2011, then it goes up, and then it peaks up here as the third, the third most used. What is that? January 2016. You see the little yellow line down there? It's like a little yellow line. Here, I'll show you over here. Get my exercise in this way. You see that little point right there where it's the third? It's in third place? That's UC browser, which I had no idea what that was until I looked at the data during that semester. What was that, January? What was that, spring of 2016? It all becomes a blur for me at some point with all the years I've taught, so just, just bear with me. So you'll notice that it actually was third over 2017, 2018, and then it just went kaput. So when I was teaching web development classes during that time, I actually had to talk about UC browser, which I had never heard before until like 2016. But you notice that it was good for like a couple of years, and then all of a sudden it just fizzled out, just like everything else. So when you're thinking about using web browsers, I just want you to see this to understand that Times have changed. Will there be an awesome browser that comes out that defeats Chrome? I don't know. Maybe. Because you notice that Chrome is kind of like leveled off over the last couple of years. So who knows? Maybe, maybe a company will put out an awesome browser that we all, just, we all have to have. But who knows? We don't, we don't know this. But anyway, just wanted to share some data with you. So again, we don't have to type in the protocol anymore. What I'd like you to understand with this is hypertext transfer protocol. A lot of us see hypertext transfer protocol secure now, HTTPS. So I want you to think about this. A protocol is simply a set of rules that our browser, yes, I'm going to touch the computer again. So our browsers, we are the client device, and we are requesting this hypertext from a server. So that's the client-server relationship. So our web browser. We type in an address, and we're asking the server for permission to view, the, to view the content, but that's what the protocol is. So HTTPS is what we use a lot now. I remember when email was not HTTPS, it was just HTTP, which that kind of scares me a little bit that it was like that at one point. But now all your email is secure now. And what that means is if you put a username and password in, it's encrypted and cannot be intercepted by others. But of course, now we have a lot more things than just the username and password. We have to have our two-factor authentication and all that other fun stuff now. But we'll talk more about that in chapter nine, actually. 
So the other parts of the uniform resource locator include the subdomain, which we don't even have to type that in anymore, right? You just type in Amazon.com and it just comes up. So for your extra credit, I know some of you are staring at it right now. The only thing I want for the extra credit is that middle part, that domain name. I don't want the .com, I don't want the www, I just want that word for your extra credit. So I only want this. Because trust me, I'll know what you're looking up. Unless, unless, <laughs> you give me something I've never seen before, then I'm gonna have to go look it up. <laughs> but yes, I will, I will read your, your list. Oh yeah, and for the extra credit, you can't just give me 10 websites total. You've got to give me 10 for every one of those categories. There's 11 categories. I want 10 or more for every one of those categories. And that's all you've got to do is fill it out because I think it's in Excel format. You just download it, you fill it out, you upload it, and it's done for the extra credit. That's a, that's a give me five points. Anyway, you really can't get that wrong unless you don't follow the directions. And then I'm going to ask you to do it again. I'll be, nice on, I'll be nice on the chapter two one. I'll let you do it again. Okay, but anyway, after the domain name is the top level domain. There are literally thousands of these. .com, .biz, .net, .org, I can go on all day, .museum, .bike. I've seen some really interesting ones lately. Um, but yes, there is actually a registry called ICANN, I-C-A-N-N, -N, and people can actually submit ideas for new top-level domains. And literally, thousands of applications are submitted to this place, and they have to review them to see, yes, .xxx is one of them too, but they have to review these to, for the public to actually use them and approve them for them to be used. After the top-level domain, you see a file path. Usually there's a slash and there's a file path after that. In the old days, I would always take off the ends of the file paths to see what kind of access I had inside of all the folders in the website. I'd find all kinds of neat stuff. And I'm going, I, don't, I shouldn't even have access to this, right? And I'm like, oops, I guess they didn't know. Like, like on sites where they're like, you need to put in your username and password. And I'm like, hey, there's some slashes and there's some stuff I can take off. So I did that and I bypassed the username and password and I got the information that I needed without having to put one of those in. So file paths are pretty neat too. Really quick, also there are country code top level domains, which I have in the bottom of the slide. So various countries have like .it, .cn, et cetera. There's 160 plus of those that are floating around out there as well. So yes, when you're look, especially when you're looking to browse and you're looking at sites, please do pay attention to some of these because if you're going to like some foreign site, I'd be, Sometimes I'd be like, I'd be weary of that, like a dot, what is it, like a dot CN or something. I don't really go to those sites, so just like, it's like the student that comes in and says, I got a virus from downloading illegal movies from this website, and I'm like, what do you want me to do about it? I told you not to do it. I told you not to click on those sites. So anyway, just make sure that, especially when you're performing searches or going to websites, that HTTPS is what you need to see as the protocol, on because they always give you the link. So when you're searching for things, they should provide you with that link. So always make sure there's an HTTPS in front of anything that you're surfing to find. All right, HTML, hypertext markup language. I know that's I know that's an, that's actually going to be an answer on one of your uh, extra credits, not this week's, but hypertext markup language has been around for a really long time. I always ask the question, why do I care about hypertext markup language? You all view websites, right? I think, last I, last I checked, you all, you, you all go to websites, right? Do you like to find your information right away? Yeah, I'm pretty impatient, so if I don't find my information within like, if I don't find my information like within 30 seconds after I get onto a site, I move on. Well, hypertext markup language looks like the code that you see in the upper right corner. It is not a programming language, it is a markup language. We are merely marking up a page. That's all we're doing. And we have links that connect us from resource to resource to resource. And we can click on these links 
all day long. But our web browsers, whether they be a mobile web browser that you see on your phone, which makes everything look a lot smaller, or you're browsing on these large monitors, those HTML commands interpret what you see through the web browser itself. Now this is sort of a rhetorical question, even though I don't want it to be. Do we download things other than web pages? No. No? All right. Unless... YouTube people, where are you? You do know that you're downloading the, the actual video, right? You're like, but Nick, I'm on the website. Well, yeah, you are on the website, but you're still downloading the content. It doesn't play until it's downloaded. So if you have a really fast connection, you're not even going to notice anything. It's just going to play, and you're going to move. You're going to move on. But yes, we download video. Do we download audio also? Sure. Do we download documents? Yeah. Do we download spreadsheets? Yeah. I could go all day with that. I'm not going to. But yes, we download a lot of other things other than just web pages from the web. All right. Over time, especially the last couple of semesters, I've really beefed up this slide with more information. So if anybody in here is in our IT program and you've got that web development class, that CIS 133 or CIS 233, you got to take those. Cascading style sheets you are going to definitely see during that class, especially that 133 class. So cascading style sheets allow you to create a consistent look among all your web pages. So for example, if you want all the fonts to be the same size, the same color, you can put that all into a style sheet and apply that style sheet to the HTML files. Yes, that's how that works. And then you have a nice uniform look among all of your pages that are within your website. So cascading style sheets is called cascading style sheets because the styles cascade down through the HTML code until that style is changed within the HTML code. Otherwise, it just keeps cascading down, down the code, down the code, down the code. So when you're looking at websites, most likely there is CSS on the back end of that. JavaScript, you like my little note down at the bottom of this slide? JavaScript is a scripting language. It is not a programming language. Java is a programming language. So JavaScript lets you put in things like it changes the way the mouse moves around. When somebody moves the mouse around the page, it turns it into a dinosaur or something, or something else. Maybe you're going to have the current date or current month or a calendar on there as well. You can use JavaScript for that. And you just simply put them into, the, you put them into your HTML code. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, definitely one of my favorite terms in this class. That's what Ajax is. It's not the stuff we clean with. So keep in mind that sites like especially like when you're purchasing travel, like plane tickets, or you're going to eBay for an auction, and there's constant updating information. Stock websites have this. But what they do is they use a combination of JavaScript and extensible markup language to retrieve data from a database that's constantly changing and refreshes the web page in real time, like milliseconds. You can actually time it to the milliseconds. I've done this. <clears throat> that's what XML does. So XML extracts that data from the database and it displays it on the web browser or in the web browser in real time. I mentioned this earlier. Mobile browsers, mobile devices, phones, tablets, these browsers are a lot smaller on these devices than your regular desktops. So everything is going to look smaller. Uh, there should be no animations on mobile browsing because, well, mobile browsing when the page loads, you want it to load fast, I hope. But now with 5G, which we'll explain that in chapter eight, we got six more weeks until we get there. But with, now with 5G, everything is a lot faster than it was, a lot faster than it was previously. But just to let you know, all the websites are gonna look a lot smaller on a phone or a tablet as opposed to a desktop. There are four web utilities I'm gonna talk about in today's class, and those include plugins, filters, file transfer utilities, and internet security suites. Now please note, with plugins, there are literally like thousands and thousands and thousands of plugins. I'm only going to mention a couple of them right now. So if you ever wondered 
how you can view PDF documents in your web browser, how you can watch video, how you can listen to audio. You need things called plugins. You need little programs called plugins in your web browser that enable you to do that. Sometimes you will be browsing and it will ask you to in install an extension, which is essentially a plugin. It works just like a plugin does. So with those, you install it and then you're able to work with the content that's on the page or be able to view the content or listen to the content that is on the web in the web browser. But keep in mind with plugins, it's specific to the web browser. It's not specific to anything else. Okay, so when you open up a PDF, like our syllabus for example, and you see it in your web browser, instead of having to download it, you're just seeing it in the web browser and then you can close it. But that, you have to have a plugin to be able to do that. But nowadays, especially like with Chrome for example, it comes with that built in so we don't have to install it. Yes? So is cookies considered a plugin? Ah, it? that is not. That is a whole other thing and we will get into that in chapter nine. We have seven more weeks before we start. We're going to talk about cookies, crackers. We're going to talk about all kinds of food groups. Today we're talking about spam. We'll be talking about spam in a few minutes. So be ready. Be ready for spam. Okay. But anyway, no, that's that's entirely separate. We'll I'll, we'll definitely go over that in that chapter. All right. Filters. Yes. Employers put fil put filters on things. Colleges put filters on things that you can't see certain websites. I remember when they used to block Facebook and students went nuts. Like they went crazy when they, when they did that. But guess who taught them to work around it? <coughs> Somebody was like, okay, Mr. Rouse, I need you to help me work around. I'm like, yeah. So you just got to install the anonymous browser. And then you install the anonymous browser off the flash drive. That's how you work around security on that, during that time. <laughs> and yeah, it's a little different now. I think they allow you to do it now. <laughs> I think they allow you to view it now. But when they didn't, I always had the workaround to where they could log in to Facebook and they're like, hey, I'm in. I'm like, shh, keep it down. I'm like, don't want people to know you can do that. So then every student was like, come on, Mr. Rouse, you just got to teach us all how to do it. So I think I had like a session where we all like installed it. I'm like, you do realize this is dangerous, right? We're not supposed to be doing this. Anyhow, oh, I hope nobody heard that. Oh, the camera's on there. Okay, now the camera, camera's on, and so it's okay. Right, so anyway, there's a lot of different filters that are out there that you can install and use. They're all listed right there. File transfer utilities. So we use these to download files and upload files. Uh, FileZilla, I've actually used FileZilla quite a bit, especially for transferring files from web servers onto my home computer so I can work on them. Then I upload them back to the server to update the files. They're actually really, really neat, especially when you need to transfer like thousands of files at one time. It's all like drag and drop. You can just drag them from the server onto your desktop. Boom, it's there in the folder. It's real easy. And there are three, there are three different types of programs. There's BitTorrent, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, Web-based file services, which it's web-based, so that means you log in. Technically, Google Drive is a web-based file transfer service. Think about that. Bless you. Because you can save files to it, and you can take files from it. So that's a web-based file transfer service. But just keep in mind that if you ever see FTP, that's file transfer protocol. It is not hypertext transfer protocol. So remember earlier I talked about the protocol, which are the rules for exchanging data from servers to your client device and your client device back to the server. So that's what the file transfer protocol is, is to specifically, bless you, transfer files. Some people like to install internet security suites. No, I do not have one because, well, what did I say earlier? As long as you're going to websites that you're supposed to be going to, you really should be all right. There really should be no problems whatsoever. So that's, that's going to be my big thing today is if it's a site that you're like, it looks really weird, do not click on the link. Do not click on the link. Do not go there because you don't know what's going to happen. I don't know either. So yes, when I start seeing weird stuff, I'm like, oops, I shouldn't have clicked that. And I got to go back and run the virus scan and all that good stuff. But internet security suites are out there too. Bless you as well. All right. So email addresses are composed of three different components, well, technically two different components. Your username, 
Then there's at, so yes, all of your Maricopa email addresses, it's your MEID, that's your username, so I know your username. Then it's at, and then it's the domain name after that. The at symbol was actually developed in 1971, so we're over 50 years of using the at symbol for email addresses as well. None of this is new technology. People are still using email all the time. Is it the 1135? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll, 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 be, we'll be out of here by then. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I knew that. Anyway, I just didn't want to say anything. Anyway, like I haven't seen that person in here before. Email is still being used by people. And just to let you know, when I compose an email to somebody, there better be a subject line. Because if you send me something with no subject, I'm just going to go boop, and it gets deleted automatically. So and then people go, did you get my email? And I look at my trash, and it said no subject. I'm like, yeah, you didn't put a subject in, so I deleted it. <clears throat> what was your email about? But anyway, usually you should have, always have a subject. Of course, you're going to address whoever you're addressing it to in the to field, anybody that you're copying in the CC field. I use BCC a lot. Like I use BCC a ton when I'm sending emails. Because I want other people to know that I'm doing this, but I don't want the person that I'm sending it to to know that all these other people know about it. So yes, I use BCC a lot on my emails. And sometimes, if I want to email the class, I will put all your addresses in the BCC fields so none of you see each other's email addresses. You don't know who I'm sending it to. I used to have to do that on a massive scale for this college. So I've done, I've used that a lot. Anyway, messages should be straight and to the point. Like really straight and really to the point. Anytime I get a five paragraph email, what does my brain do? Not want to read it. I read like two sentences and I'm like, I'm like checked out for the next five paragraphs. I'm telling you, you gotta have short messages, like one paragraph. Now granted, I sent you the initial message in Canvas, it was long, but you haven't received one from me since. So yeah, that's how that works. So anyhow, Please don't send people five paragraph emails if you, if you, or I reply back, thank you, Nick, as my, as my reply back. And then my boss comes storming into my office. You did not read that whole email in two minutes. There's no, there's no way you read that in two minutes. And I'm like, you're right. I read two sentences. I checked out and I thanked them. I'm being polite. When I said I deleted the email after, I'm like, what did the email say? He hated that stuff. Anyway, you'll also see uh, signatures on the bottom of a lot of emails as well. Moving on. All right. I hope this isn't too tough here. There's a difference between client-based email systems and web-based. Client-based are actual applications that you install on your phone, like you have your mail app, or you might have Outlook. That's a client-based email system. Or if you actually install the Gmail application on your phone, that's client-based email. Web-based is different. Web-based is when we access it through what? The web. the web. That was rough, I know. The stuff I ask in this class is tough sometimes. Like later in this class, like a few weeks from now, when I ask how fast something is, the answer is gonna be like fast, okay? So you're getting it. So that's good. So yes, through the web. We access that through the web. All right, I'm done with that. Ah, yes. That's funny, I actually never tried this until like a year ago. Now I like, can't even stop eating the damn stuff. So anyway, and now that I know they make 15,000 varieties of it, it's, yeah, it's, that's dangerous. That's why I'm getting bigger. I was 130 pounds like up until like about a year ago. Now, now I'm not. So our email systems are actually doing a better job these days at detecting spam, at detecting emails that we don't want and throwing it into other folders or throwing it into spam or trashing them, trashing the emails. So I've noticed that I get a lot less junk mail now than I've ever got before. And I don't know why that is other than, other than the only answer that I can think of is the email systems are becoming more sophisticated now to pick up spam, to pick up emails that we don't want. Some of you Gmail users, I know you love the promotions folder and I know you love the social folder. I know you love those. Again, when somebody sends me an email, well, how come you didn't get my email? Then I go look at the promotions folder and go, yeah, it went to promotions. That's why I didn't see it. Or if one of you sent an email to me here at the school and I don't get it, it's probably one of those other folders that I don't check. I don't ever check. 
So it's possible that happens as well. Anyway, we can get viruses. Yes, we're going to have a chapter where I talk about viruses and worms. So viruses, destructive programs, are often attached to an unsolicited email. So you will get a spam message. You will think it's legitimate, even though you should always check the header of the email. That really shows you who it came from. You should always check that if it, looks, if it doesn't look legitimate, or just trash it, or just hit delete. That's another good one. Don't ever, 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 ever download an attachment to an email, especially if you don't recognize the person that's sending it. That's my number one thing. My, okay, outside of copying and pasting, that would be my number two thing I need you to take away from this, is if you get a strange looking email, just delete it. Don't do anything with it, delete it. I'm gonna be talking about this stuff again later in this course, not today. The Can Spam Act was enacted quite a while ago. And it does say that every marketing email that's from any company must include an opt-out option or an unsubscribe option. And yes, I'm unsubscribed from a lot of stuff over the years. All right, but anyway, spam blockers, spam filters. When I send an email out to students, sometimes mine goes straight to spam. And students will go, you know your message went to spam, right? I'm like, dang it. Then I gotta sit to everybody in class, hey, check your spam folder. So now I send messages in Canvas as opposed to email, because in Canvas, you're guaranteed to get my message. So that's why I do it that way now. I hope you know that there are like a billion messaging apps out there. A short message service, 140 characters max. Once it goes over 140, it turns it into a multimedia message service, or MMS. Yes, our phones warn us now when our text message is too long. So yeah, sometimes I have to, I'm like, I got three characters left. Just put like, okay, send it. So yes, so multimedia message service is normally for video, images, and really, really, really long text. But yes, we can message instantly to anybody right now. It's, it's crazy. I get messages from like five different applications on my phone. And I'm like, okay, people, I actually have work to do during the day. You know, I can't just sit there and check messages all day. Social networking has been around forever. Yes, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. I can go all day with these two. Pinterest, if you don't know Pinterest, I use that for recipe I do. Folks, I even cook in the house, so I find recipes everywhere. So yes, Pinterest I use for recipe ideas. It's great, it's neat. Oh yeah, uh, one of the quiz questions for today, I'm, it's not in any of my slides. <clears throat> so in Facebook, they have these people that all get together and they call it a Facebook group. That's gonna be your answer for, <clears throat> that's gonna be your answer for that quiz question today. Don't worry, we're almost done. You're like, we're almost done. Yeah, we're almost done. My person that needed to like leave early isn't even here today. Okay, so I was, trying to, I was trying to do that for them. But anyway, now we have, we've always had blogs and microblogs. Just keep in mind that WordPress, for example, you can generate websites, but WordPress is primarily used for people that like to blog or post stories about themselves. And with those, the date, their date and time stamped and arranged with the most recent post first, and then the older ones are down, 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 down. So if you see a website or you're on a website that looks like that, where there's like a chronological order to what's been posted, it's probably been built with WordPress, most likely. X is out there now. So yes, people love to post short things. Of course, X does allow you to post longer, longer things now. But anyway, I used to use it for just posting random links to technology stuff, and then I just stopped. I just stopped. I haven't used it in, I haven't used it in years. However, it is nice that I can see other people post stuff that I actually get, and I can actually do that. You're like, so you're a lurker. Yes, I'm a lurker. I don't post anything, I just watch. No, you can't do that. All right, here's some other interesting terms. So now we're getting into Wikipedia. I told you we were gonna talk about that. Anyhow, if you think about what I'm doing in this class, so I have the live stream. So our live stream is technically called a webcast. Our recorded stream, which is on YouTube, that's our podcast that you can download and play later. 
I don't call it a podcast, even though we probably should. We should probably come up with a good name for that, right? The recorded one. No, the Nick Rouse podcast. You don't like that? No, doesn't work for you. Okay, we'll find another name for it. Anyway, wikis. Yes, wikis allow people to contribute content, and the most notorious one of them all is Wikipedia. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to use Wikipedia for your English papers, I have some advice to give you, because I've done this. You can't write a 20-page paper, paper in six hours, right? I did it all with Wikipedia. I got an A on that paper. That was beautiful. It was some of my best work. When you're citing stuff from Wikipedia, it's all the stuff at the bottom of the page where they give you all the articles and stuff. That's what you got to use for your references. You cannot say, I got it from Wikipedia, ever. Your English teachers will, like take you down. So I'm telling you, if you're taking an English class and you're going to borrow from Wikipedia, always use the references at the bottom. Because then your teacher will go to that reference in your paper and click on it and it'll actually take them to that information instead of Wikipedia. So Wikipedia, bad for references in your English papers. The articles themselves that are listed, good for references in your papers. There you go. I hope, I hope you got something out of that. All right, we have many search tools that are out there, like many, 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 many. So with search engines, with search engines, there are these little tiny programs called spiders. And these spiders go through, yes, I'm going to do this. It's almost Halloween time, right? So I got to do, I got to talk about spiders. So it goes through the code, the HTML code that I showed you earlier. It goes through the code and it crawls through the code and it collects text, it collects links, it collects all kinds of stuff and puts it into this massive database. So the spiders collect the data. When you go to search, and here's another quiz question, I'm going to give you two answers right here. So spiders, and then the other one is called hits. So when you perform a search and you get a list of links, those are called hits. So yes, that's another answer to one of your quiz questions today. But when you're on a website, you got to think about four things when you're evaluating content. First is authority. So is the company or organization the expert on what you're trying to find? Or is it just some person blogging about what you're trying to find? You always have to ask that question. As a researcher, I actually like to combine both. I like to combine the expert, and I also like to combine the opinions into my research whenever I do a research paper. It drives my instructors crazy, I'm sure. But authority is one thing you need to look at. Accuracy. Is the information that you're trying to look up accurate? Like, is it actually going to work? Now, when I'm looking up recipes, I do have to, like, question how they got the certain tablespoons or the cups. I need to, like, process that myself. Is this accurate? Will this actually work? Objectivity. So, again, some blogs might be biased, might be completely biased. But that's for you to determine. Like when you start reading something, you're probably going to sit there at some point and go, why does this not sound like it's objective? Why does it sound like it's, like they're really for this stance, right? And then you're reading that, and you're like, no, I'm going to move on to the next, I'm going to move on to the next article or the next web page. So you got to look at objectivity. And last but not least, we're not talking about money. We're going to talk about money in a minute, because that's the last part of the lecture, is currency. How current? is the information that you're looking up. I get driven crazy doing research because in technology, if I'm looking at an article from 2017, it's probably not the same now. So I gotta find something more current. So currency is a really big deal as well when you're looking at information on the web. All right, last part of today's lecture is electronic commerce also known as e-commerce. It is the process of buying and selling goods over the internet. Yes, we have many, many apps that we can use now to perform this. And we don't have to physically go to places anymore. We can do it all online. And there are three types. There's business to consumer, consumer to consumer, and business to business. So anytime we do online banking, anytime we shop at Amazon, anytime we shop at any online store, especially through applications, that's what we're doing. It's a company that's providing us, the consumer, with some kind of service. It could be a service, it could be a product, but they're supplying us with that. 
with consumer to consumer. If you've heard of eBay, you know what I'm talking about. These are web auctions where I can sell you something. But I have another question though. Can businesses sell you items through auction? Uh, yes. <laughs> so eBay, for example, could be C to C, but it can also be what I said before, business to consumer as well. It can be both of those. Oh, can businesses sell to other businesses on eBay? Yes. Yeah, why not? So it's actually all three types that I'm talking about, both consumer to consumer. No, Craigslist is not consumer to consumer because when I buy something from Craigslist, I actually have to go to the location and give them the money. That's not electronic. That is me going and physically giving money to somebody. Now, if you go to the location and you pay them electronically, that could be electronic commerce. <clears throat> that would be classified as electronic commerce. But if I'm handing physical money to somebody, that is not electronic commerce. What? I know how to find $20 mini refrigerators. Those are, those are nice. No? I, drove, I, drove, I think I drove 20 miles to get that thing, but it was worth it. <clears throat> Still have it. It's lasted 15 years now. Okay. So, what, no $20 fridges on, on Craigslist? No? Oh, that's right. It's inflation now, right? It's like 40 now. Okay. All right, anyway, let me move on. So the most money volume-wise with electronic commerce is business to business. Organizations need, I always use the toilet paper example. Every organization likely needs toilet paper. And they got to buy that from somewhere. They're not buying it from consumers. That's, that's for sure. So all these companies that need raw materials as well to for them to build products or sell things, they need to get that from somewhere. So business to business is a huge, huge, huge amount of money when it, when it comes to electronic commerce. Again, that's not gonna be, I don't think that's gonna be anywhere on your quizzes or exams. All right, let's get to digital money. So yes, there's gonna be a question on your quiz for this, digital cash, right? So yes, there have been, I, I do not handle physical money very often. I don't have any in my wallet. I haven't had any in my wallet for quite some time. I do it all electronically. When I go to the store, it's like you either tap your phone or you pull the card out and you use it. But it's all electronic. When I wanna pay somebody, I always ask them, can I just sell you the money? And then I just sell them the money and they get the money and they're like, thank you, Nick. It's been received, I appreciate that. And I don't actually touch physical money anymore, which is really strange. But it's strange to me. But this is where we're at. We have so many different ways to pay now, pay people electronically. We don't even have to deal with actual cash anymore. All right, I told you you were gonna hear about this like a thousand times in this class. Here it is again. So one more time, cloud computing, we're shifting the computing activities from our desktops, and now we're saving everything to servers. We're saving everything into the cloud. So it frees us up from having to own, maintain, or store applications, store data. We can store that data now on a server. We don't have to have like our own hard drives to save everything anymore. We really don't. We can do it all online. Somebody goes, they signed up for my CIS 411 class, and they went, what do you mean I can do the whole class on my phone? You can write documents on your phone, right? You can type documents on your phone. Technically, you can do the whole dang thing on your phone. And then get, and the student goes, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You don't, even, you, don't even need a, you don't even need a full computer for it. But anyway, it's all saved to the cloud anyway. So anyway, the three basic components of this are the clients. Those are us, the end users, the ser internet service provider. We have to have an internet service provider. And we also have to have access to the internet, like the physical internet. All right, so our career in IT for the chapter are webmasters. Yes, webmasters develop and maintain websites and resources. Normally this position is found in the marketing department within an organization. Uh, not all webmasters back up the company's website. However, being a volunteer webmaster myself, I have to make sure that I make backups just in case the server decides to, and we have to upload all that again to some other server. So yes, you should always be making copies of your websites, always making backups, but primarily works with the marketing department. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but yes, our cars are making us more and more distracted every day. 
yes, I have one of these now. Well, not one of these, but I got a little panel in my car for the radio and stuff that I have to push through. Yes, I listen to the actual radio, folks. I do not. Yes, isn't that scary? I actually listen to actual radio stations. If you don't know what radio stations are, you can Google that. This was a search engine class, right? Oh, yeah. So anyway, for your extra credit, you really can't get the extra credit wrong this week. Just make sure that you put 10. I want 10 domain names for each of the 11 categories. That's 110 if you do the math. No, don't just like do five of them and submit it. I'm not going to give you credit. Or I'll send it back to you and say, please finish. Please finish the extra credit. So make sure that you're putting 10 in for every category. You literally can't get this wrong. Like you, you just have to totally be off base, which I don't think anybody's going to be. Oh, hey. Hi. Do I look okay today? Is the hair all right? All right. Hair's okay today? All right. It's real. Okay. <laughs> so everybody online, everybody online, I want to thank you very, very much for watching today. I hope you have a fantastic, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. My person who put 1-2, that's not today. We did that on Thursday. We are not doing that. Okay. My other my other person in the chat is going to be banned for doing cheap viewers on star star star. They will be banned from the chat. I just got one. But thank you, my one person that chatted one dash two was last week. So we're going to be doing project two on word project two on Thursday. Thank you, everybody, who's been watching. See you later.